Oh yeah. Y'all 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 need to invite Cassidy out, please. Come on, y'all. Come on. I mean, we're not that bad. I mean, the Cream Club was a pretty bad recommendation, but we'll work on it. We've got some other good ones in the chamber. You got to see what sticks. You got to throw a bunch out there. So 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 tell me like what what was your most recent supper club? I just want to kind of get an idea of what these was things it are. Was it Lola? Yeah. I have, um, so I'm doing a couple of different types of events. Um, we did one at Cart Driver, which was really fun. Um, we did one at Cart Driver, which was really fun. We did one at Cart Driver, which was incredible. We had pizzas just all over the place, great music playing, great wine being poured, and it was kind of like a mix and mingle, like happy hour type of vibe. Low hire Rhino Cart Driver. Oh, hi. Nice. Nice. I mean, they have a natural wine list. I work from there behind that little French wall or whatever the fuck they call those things, those little fake wooden things. That That's, location's great. Love it. It's oh, so I, great. I've never been to car drivers. I came to my supper club, so I'm just showing them, like, hey, this is where I would be. We had one at Giovanina's Broken Italian downstairs. That place is awesome. We've done a mix of things, but this month I'm doing a partnership with the Chimichurri Bros at American Bonded. Okay, nice. And when is this? How do people get tickets to these kinds of events? So I post about them on my socials, Cassie Eats, Instagram, and TikTok. Do you want TikTok people? We're on it, but we can't get anything through because most of our stuff is – I mean, we can't get anything through on Instagram either. But yeah. we get everything pulled down. If you have, like, a vape pen in the background, this shit just gets nowhere. So we stick to Instagram despite the fact that we get no love there. But <laughs> Well, I share – Twitter, too. Release Chicken. Date. I don't do Twitter. I share a release date on those things, but I have an email list that you can sign up for to get updates. We're doing immersive yoga at the Frida Kahlo exhibit at the end of the month. So come check it out if you're local, but that's just one of the Immersive yeah. yoga and, like, weed? Oh, you guys don't know about the immersive Frida Kahlo. Oh, <laughs> oh, yeah. You're talking about like the, It's kind of like the Van Gogh one that they had. Yeah, yeah okay. It's exactly like the Van Gogh one. So okay. Nice. That would be really cool. cool. Yeah, I love how you're. That's a good reach you have there too. Like you're doing a bunch of like active and then a little bit of a partying. Like you're doing a bunch of different things to keep yeah. people going. We're trying to do something similar in that. Like we're gonna do a casino night to try to raise a little bit of money for some folks and make it like a fun theme. But I like this yoga idea, Chris. Let's write this down. We may need to join. Tell us about it. What's that entail? Shout out to Kai. Shout out to Kai. He's a seltzer guy. Oh, yeah, he is. No. Kai's her husband, by the way. Oh, yeah. That was in the part that was edited out. Yeah, god damn it. That was a good one. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I mean, I don't know. I had to delete some files for us to make this continue. It should give me like a beep or something if it, if, if it stops recording. Um, but anyways, yeah. Okay, so we have some releases going this summer. We're going to do some parties at the park. Those are terrible. Oh, but, like, you know, I want to go to those. Like, I want to go to happy hour and talk to the bitches who love Bravo, who also know of other great dispensaries in Denver, and have similar interests. Or maybe want to go hiking or take a new yoga class. Like, those are the types of combos I'm here for. Well, let's talk a little bit about that because, you know, you've broached on the topic now twice. And, you know, you do have this nice little way of blending cannabis into the everyday, maybe, house mom's life, you know, like you're kind of bridging that gap. How, what you meant, and you mentioned it earlier on the uh, podcast where you weren't able to kind of be your full transparent self in regards to cannabis when you had the full-time job. Tell us a little bit about your introduction to cannabis. What's your favorite way to get high? Well, that's, that's a, there's many questions in there, but. Well, yeah, we don't, <laughs> we're not good interviewers. of it, 
to education, resources, also lots of different types of products and so many different things. But now, fast forward to now, so I mentioned I launched the podcast. I have quite a few episodes on my podcast about cannabis because I feel like it's, it's not, like you said, like brought into the conversation naturally. It's not. It's more stigmatized. It's more, you know, I'll take a break. No, you're good. I'm just charging. I forgot we have Zoom guests coming, so I wanted to make sure we have battery. You're groovy. All right. Continue. I'm listening. Okay. You're trying to destigmatize it for just the natural conversation of, you know, life for someone opposite of us. You know, we, yeah. we live well, a I different think, life. Especially as it relates to women, I feel like that's mostly who I'm talking to. I see myself as, well, I'm talking to women in general, but I also see myself as we call them spotters. Exactly. Everybody knows the term. <laughs> but it's the the popular like I had an animal once and I died. Weed's not for me, and like that's just kind of where they leave it because they, you know. They had a brownie in college that had no actual dosage and and things of going yeah. of the nature. Yeah, I mean the stigma is there in all sorts of capacities, and so I want to know how you shook that and how you shake it for others because I have a lot of questions for you and how you approach your your demo in that regard. Well, I think in terms of relating it to my audience, so just talking about my experience and sharing from what it is, my experience and what I've learned and what I've noticed, I think is one thing. But the second thing is it's pretty easy to see that a lot of systems and stigmas that exist in our country are for insane reasons or reasons that we will never understand. And it's easy to see, like, Weed was cannibalized. Uh, I almost said cannibalized. <laughs> Weed works. <laughs> Shout out to our friends at Eden. It was stigmatized, demonized back in the 60s, and, and the progression of how the stigma has evolved is interesting to me because so many people that I find, especially, this is it, when people find out that I'm a stoner and they didn't know that I was a stoner, they're like, but you're so successful. You're so organized. You have so many things going on. How, 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 how? And they have an idea of what they think that somebody who smokes weed is like. You should point them to Snoop Dogg as well. Like, that motherfucker's got like 80 million jobs. And he smokes more weed than all of us. All of us combined. But, I mean, you face that stigma all the time. Anytime you have the discussion around, oh, you know, cannabis brands and things of that nature, does it come off as, oh, you're a stoner because of how you come off? You put them on their ass? I mean, think about me walking in there and then being like, yeah, can I take a look at your concentrates? I want to see a difference between, like, your live resins and, you know, I just ask for what I'm looking for. If I go in there with Kai, I'm treated differently than how I'm treated when I go in there by myself because they're not expecting me to know what I'm talking about. And then once I do, then they're like, oh, I can engage in this way. That's interesting. So here's that kinda, is interesting. Here, yeah, and here's I mean, because you're not wrong, and it's probably not just in the dispensary that that is the case as well. Yeah. But here's a question too, like going back to kind of maybe women being like misunderstood in the cannabis world and stuff like that a little bit. When you first started experimenting with cannabis, who did you like? Did you do it with like some of your guy friends, or like was oh. it you, you know? Like I'm just curious as to like. I mean, I. I mean, I don't know why you would think we would know that, though. I don't know. Like, have y'all not looked at my ancestry tree dot com? Yeah, yeah. I, 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 I did not. You. So you grew up in a house full of boys? No, I have one brother oh. and um, five cousins that are boys, and my mom was a teacher, so she was home in the summers watching everybody. So it was just always me and the boys, and I have always. I'm like a guy's girl, so. Flash forward to college, all the dudes are smoking bombs in the living room at the party, and I think that women would be interested if they felt like there was an entry point, but there really isn't because it's pretty intimidating, and especially when you see, like, a bomb, you're like, ooh, knowing that you had an animal that one time, and you're like, oh, I don't think I could do that. I enjoy being the person that takes the bomb into the other room with the girls and shuts the door and is like, okay, the guys are gone, let's talk about this, this is not going to be a dumb question. Here's how you play it. Drip like, it and rip it. The specific steps, because nobody tells you. Like, even if you want to go to a dispensary and buy weed, like, most people don't know you need a grinder or something to grind with weed or, you know what I mean? Like, 
yeah. the specifics of like what you would need to get started. So I feel like it's it is it can be an intimidating process, and then when you speak of it in that regard of like it's eight dudes sitting around that like look like fucking heads with a bunch of neck beards, you're like. Oh, it must just be like, oh, pass me that bong, bruh. Like, but it's been like that, you know. Like Chris, we talked about it earlier with the uh, with the the dispensary that looks like an Apple store. Like making things more approachable for all parties involved, because you know it's no longer the days of walking in and it's a Bob Marley and a half, you know, and a half baked and a dazed and confused poster. It's with you know the same music playing above, like. It's more of a come in, feel comfortable, like feel free to ask questions. And even our friends over at Seed Smith, like that Louisville location, they have like fucking comfortable clothes. You're like, oh, do you want to smoke and then sit and wear clouds as you sit on the couch? They have all of those things. So you can shop peruse, so to speak, you know, but that's a great point is like breaking down the barriers of intimidation, at least, I think. Yeah. I'm not afraid to ask questions, and I'm not afraid to enter the circle of bearded men and be like, yo, what's going on here? Like, teach me about this. And so I learned that way. And then also, when I go to dispensaries, I'm not afraid to ask questions. And I don't just go in there and be like, give me something that makes me sleep. Like, I do my own research, also experimentation, and then say, you know, can you help me with this based off of this? And be a little bit more clarifying in the questions that I ask. And then, before you know it, I'm dabbing on the daily. So dabs are the way. That was the original question was, how do you get high? And look how we got there. Yeah. And that's why we do what we do. <laughs> and so, I mean, you obviously, you know, you're heavily entrenched in the scene, despite what some folks may know. But one thing you've done, and it's kind of a page that we took out of your book, is you built this rapport through, like yours is through health and wellness. Ours is putting you on local dank eats or things that we appreciate as good wine or booze. Um, and you've built this like rapport so they trust you when they go to the little like, oh, well, you know, ask these questions, you know, seek out these answers or whatever from a dispensary. We're going to have you answer some questions from some guests um, that will be joining us through a Zoom call. And we're just going to talk with them about their cannabis use. But one thing I have a question, and this is something I've been tolling with now. I mean, it was a thing 10 years ago. I know you have yours now, but I wanted to ask you a little bit about navigating the med card process. So, you know, we it's medical or recreational, and for those that aren't in Colorado or maybe have different stipulations wherever they're listening, you have unbelievable tax breaks, you know, 30% cheaper products when you shop through a medicinal license. But there are some drawbacks, like for those that are in Oklahoma and across the country that may be hunters, you know, you may get flagged when you're applying for specific gun licenses. I wanted to know how easy of it was it for you to go about through the process of getting your med card? And do you see that it's the bennies are worth, was the juice worth the squeeze now that you've had it for a hot minute and now you're smoking fairly open in the public? Yeah. You know, I, w- I was thinking about this earlier in the destigmatization of cannabis, the whole marketing of it all. And, and as we all know, once the mainstream grabs onto something and once something becomes commercialized, blanket like statements are made. So it's like, oh, this will help with sleep. And then, and I think that it's going to misconstrue the true experience of, of how people can actually learn to love it for themselves and understand that each strain and plant and product and so many different things affect each person differently. But in in that note, med versus rec, rec feels a little commercialized to me, especially since I've been a med patient since 2018 or 2019 at this point. So getting my med card was totally not a big deal at all, and I thought it was going to be so much harder 